racism and I Good morning. Welcome to Detroit in Black and White. I'm Adolf Mongo. Joining us today, the usual crew, Vanessa Moss, attorney and political consultant, Vanessa Moss. Good morning. Good morning, Good morning everybody. Alan Langle, <laughs> co-founder of Deadline Detroit, Washington Post, Detroit News, and the Eagle American. The Eagle American. That was our high school paper. Well, uh, Adolf know. was the editor. I was the sports editor. Uh, yeah, well, I had Adolf was my Jackson, boss. Mr. Jackson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we're going to have White Boy Rick on, but he likes to be called what? Well, you know, I, I think he's embraced it more now, White Boy, but it's Rich, Richard Worshi Jr., okay. Rick. Rick, uh, I call him Rick. Okay. So. Uh, Ex DC uh, U.S. Attorney Roscoe Howard. We're going to talk about Trump and Jason Rowe, a political strategist, Republican. Uh, political strategist right. and Reginald Scott, the deputy director uh, from Detroit Land Bank. Let's get going. Uh, last week, uh, let's do our outrage okay. of the week. Uh, Vanessa, your outrage of the week. So, my outrage of the week is um, let, let me say this. Last Sunday, when I woke up, I, you know, we usually grab our phones or whatever. I grab my phone and I see this story, and I actually watched the video. This young lady, she and her husband, she's there from Memphis. Uh, they're engaged in, a, in an argument. Um, they're going back and forth. And the, it was clear that the husband was trying to leave the home. And in the background, you hear his mother-in-law, uh, because the, the wife is like, she doesn't want him to leave. You hear the mother-in-law in the background, um, you know, telling him, you need to stay, take care of your kids or whatever, Okay. And in my mind, you need to stay out of it. But that that's a whole different commentary about in-laws living with. Sure. <laughs> that's yeah. a whole different commentary. But um, so uh, and apparently they have had domestic violence uh, runs for the police um, previously. So uh, he's trying to leave. He, he, he's like, take your hands off me. I mean, you it's, it's on video. And, and, you know, she's still, t the wife is talking junk or whatever. The kids are in the house and she ends up, she tells him, I'm going to, I'm going to, I ought to kill you. She takes a gun and she kills him. This is all on Facebook live. Her mother then tries to protect her daughter. She tries to delete or get rid of the evidence. Okay. Of what just happened on Facebook live, which was the murder. And that was a murder of her son-in-law. I'm outraged that you are the mother, okay? You are the older person in this situation. There is no way that this should have happened. You should have been there de-escalating the problem. You know what? He's trying to leave. You come back over here and sit down. That, that kind of thing. But then you try to get rid of the evidence I am outraged what that that happened. No. I don't know. They haven't charged the the the, the uh, mother, mother or mother in law yet. But I, in my estimation, she should be. Um, I just is, is I'm the just wife out, in custody? oh she's in custody. Uh, yeah. She's the in custody. The mother won't be charged. So. Yeah, she, you know what? She should be, trying but she won't to, be. Trying to hide evidence—that's a problem. Yeah, but you know, it, it, it's a, it's. I mean, as we know now, I mean, look, you can you can erase everything on the internet, even your your email. It goes into a junk right. folder. I mean, it's so easy to pull that stuff right. out. It's right. just there's a footprint. There's so, all along the way. I, I'm outraged digitally. that it got to the point where you have a 28 year old man that's married, that have children, you have children in the house, and now he's dead. And I think that could have been avoided. Right. Uh, in addition to that, I read a story in Indiana where a five-year-old got a hold of a gun and killed his one-year-old brother. Bang, bang. I am so outraged yeah. because you know what? We, we keep hearing that. I've heard, and I, I have friends that are gun enthusiasts. It's not guns that kill people. It's people that kill 
people. Right. Yeah, but there still needs to be some kind of legislation. Oh, and you know what? There needs to be some accountability in terms of these not, adults but it, but being responsible for their right. weapons. It's not. Right. It's not. I, as a kid, I remember uh, a neighbor of mine, it, it, he was about a 16, 17, like to go hunting, cleaning his gun. Oh. His... 15 month old nephew running around the house. You know, you have to be careful. People think guns are empty, but there was still a bullet in the chamber. Shot and killed him. You and know? let me say but that people, but, 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 but uh, the more these kids die, the more these gun advocates that they, they, they double down and say, right. well, it's not, not the gun fault. You know, it's not the gun's fault. It's the people. You know, I, yeah. I don't. I know think on the saying. on the Facebook thing when you talk about the eliminate trying to eliminate some of the evidence, I think if it happens real quickly before the police arrive or whatever, I think you can get away with it. I think once the investigation starts going on that, and they start well, that gathering, would be true. That would be and, and then true, but then you can I, get obstruction. I, I believe that could be true. I'm not going to say absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's an absolute. But yeah. the, apparently, she had just had a baby too. Not too long ago, Jesus. so it might have been postpartum depression. My thing is, as the elder, you could as have a, as a de defense attorney, you, you already have, have got your defense for. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> postpartum no depression, that, absolutely. <laughs> we can stay on this subject forever. Right. Right. Let's uh, go to you, Alan. But my is going to be all the Republicans when Trump got indicted. You have Lindsey Graham going on Fox News and fun, you know and, and talking about Trump is a, a Trump is victimized. He's not the victim. And he goes on and goes, you know, he spent so much money on legal fees. And he goes, send your money. And he's given like places to send to this thief, this outright thief. And, and you have all the Republicans. You have Ron DeSantis, who who's trying to let's say, hey, I'm not going to get involved in any extradition and stuff like that. Total bullshit. It's like. Ron DeSantis, all these guys who are defending Trump, who are particularly those who are running, they want the Trump people. So if Trump sort of gets pushed aside, they're going to say, well, Ron DeSantis was good to Trump, so I can I can live with that. So they're defending this guy. They Nobody's even seen the indictment yet, and they're saying how unfair it is. I'm going to guess, and I could be totally wrong, this is totally speculative, I'm going to guess there's probably some witness intimidation or obstruction of justice charges in there. I can't imagine that Trump either directly or indirectly had somebody tell somebody, you better shut your mouth. Uh, I, you know, there's 30, you know, I don't know. I hear different numbers, two dozen counts, 31 counts. That's a lot of counts just for uh, a, a financial transaction there. There's got to be more to that. And, and you know, we'll, we'll wait and see what yeah, and yeah. you know what, well, I, to um, piggyback on talking about these people that are supporting him, you can see uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene is oh, going yeah. to New York on Tuesday. To do and she, what? Raise she, the money. She, she, she's talking about less protest. Oh. And these are the same people who are law and order who believe in the, the that, United States that, Constitution, that, that, that how hypocritical that, 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 of them that, that to start already without even knowing what's in the indictment, what they're saying or anything like right. that. I think it's just re it's, yeah. it's, it's outrageous. And, and we'll, we'll have Roscoe Watch. Howard, the DC uh, former Turn DC attorney, will be talking about it. Listen, as soon as something go down, you won't find Margaret Taylor Green anywhere. That, that, that means, <laughs> oh, I, I can tell you from, I, you know, following the Justice Department website and stuff like that, there's some days there's four or five press releases of people who have been sentenced. And I can tell you, those people aren't saying, I don't care, I'm so glad I'm going to do four or five years for Donald Trump. They're like, <laughs> I <laughs> fucked up by following this guy. Wait a minute, that's something funny that, I mean, that you should bring is something that you should bring that up because, you know, you still have people sitting in jail waiting to find out what the outcome. So Marjorie, yeah. if you really think that people are going to do a repeat of January the 6th, a lot of those people Wait, are pissed said, off yeah, because <laughs> Trump, was, he went back <laughs> was it Palm Beach? She he said at she home was chilling. Okay. Yeah, well, you read that? No. Uh, she said, yeah, by the cameras or some shit. Uh, that, that brought up crazy. But anyway, in my outrage is closer to home. The city council, I, I'm not surprised. They mm -hmm. just gave uh, Stephen Ross and uh, uh, and the Illages an ATM card <laughs> to the city of Detroit bank account and say, okay, you can have 800 million, 400 here, 800 there. How many more millions are they going to give these 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 
corporate welfare uh, bank. They already right. gave the Illiches under the condition. They said, here's whatever, $400 million to Little Caesars Arena under the condition that you developed that area. Right. You developed the hotels, the restaurants, residential. You go through there. It doesn't look a lot better, except there's more parking lots. Uh, that was not the intent. And now they come back with Stephen Ross and they're asking for eight hundred million. These are the same people that get eight hundred million that would tell uh, Miss Washington, who got eight kids, what to buy with an EBT card. Oh, you, she getting too much money. And these fuckers. All they do is beg, beg, beg. But listen, and, I, but this is the thing. Them. But this is the thing. I, I'm not mad at them for asking. I say if you don't ask, you won't know what you're gonna get. What about the people who said it was okay? What about the council that said, and they kept delaying this this vote, right? Oh, kept, I mean, to me, it was just a ruse because we. I, I will say, I'm like they're gonna get it. They asked for it. And they're they going to get and it. Then, course, and so, for it. me, the outrage should be those people that the new, you vote the, into the office. New, the new council members. Uh, they said they were gonna make a change, and we 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 different. You, you just uh, fell in line. You're doing the same bullshit. And Duggan once again is 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 the puppet master. He know how to play the game. These these assholes. What is getting two dollars uh, donations or whatever? If you look at it, but that right. that's my outrage. All right. Uh, before uh, you know, last week you know we had we we had. Tucker Carlson Jr. on here, right? Uh, Charlie LaDuff, he, he's upset. He got upset because our attorney here just asked him a couple questions and he went berserk. Well, this is the thing. And for, and for those people who watched last week or who's going to watch, you guys need to know this. He was not ambushed. He knew what we were going to talk about. And I'm also going to say this. In law school, we learned something called a term called the term is res is liquidor. The thing speaks for itself. He spoke for himself. So you guys that watch him and follow him, you see who he, he is. Really is. And that's really all and, I and, have to say. And uh, we he, he responded on his show and he let us know about it. And so we have a little uh, video there. Uh, so Joe, if you want to roll it. Okay, so I go on the show. I get up, I do my, these are my friends. Mm -hmm. They set me up, watch this one. I was, I was watching uh, your new boyfriend, Tucker Carlson, and he was talking about that Al Sharpton and- uh, to we, got, we got it, we got it. Yeah, run that. Play that. If you have, <sighs> no, listen. <laughs> Red will teach me how to speak regular, but listen. <laughs> if you weren't saying anything about this right now, Nobody would have known what happened there. It's called Detroit and black and white. And if you're going to be Detroit and black and white, <laughs> then the white guy ought to be a white guy that talks like a white guy. <laughs> Instead of being like some liberal namby pamby, let the white guy talk because the, white, should, cause should the write, white guy got shit to say. Alan the white guy's not wrong. Alan should write his book. <laughs> That's what he should be doing. Okay, so we're going to ignore the black voice forever, but now the black voice gets some prominence because the black voice is not wrong. But you should not go all the way over there not to listen to this voice. We're all family. Yeah, we're that, family. Yeah, you're, you're Why right. you do that to me? You're right. That, was, that wasn't cool. I mean, This it, book right here, Mongo, you fucker. Chapter 3. We're going to go in a century from now. This book means something called Detroit. American Autopsy, Amazon.com. <laughs> <laughs> this is all I got to You can dish it out, but you got so that you can't take it no more. <laughs> That's it. Look, I love Charlie. Charlie, we work together at Deadline Detroit. Uh, but I, I was a little bit trying to puzzled about saying that I don't talk like a white guy. And so I did a little research on the internet trying to figure out who I could maybe emulate as a white guy. So, uh, Joe? Lincoln's house is another big attraction. I don't know. You know. One of the biggest attractions is Lincoln's house. I revered him. I revered Abraham Lincoln as much as anybody else. But he's not there. <laughs> he's not coming back. He's not in the neighborhood. He's not looking for the building. It's a broken down shit house of a building. And they're standing on line for days at a time to go into his house and look and look at Schmutters and directors. <laughs>
So I all I can say is maybe for the rest of the show, I'm going to talk like this. Hey, mister, I'm talking to you, mister. But anyways, I'm going to work on that uh, white guy. But I was, you know, I was thinking actually on the way here, I was thinking like, you know, it's an insult if you tell a black person, hey, you don't sound like right. a black person. Right. But for a white person to say you don't sound like a white person, I'm like, yeah, all right, I'm OK right. with that. Right. Anyways, okay, so, so before, we, before we go to our guests. Uh, and let's play Eric uh, Eric Brown. Eric okay. Brown, yeah. okay. His outrage of the week. It's the deafening silence that has me outraged more than anything else. Five percent. Five goddamn percent. That is the amount of eighth grade students reading proficiently in the city of Detroit, the largest city in the state of Michigan, the blackest city in the state of Michigan, but only five percent of their eighth graders are reading proficiently. One out of 20. Inexcusable. The deafening silence is even worse. And when are you going to start holding these people accountable for intentionally dumbing down your kids? You have to do something. You have to. This is just, this is just crazy. Sad, pathetic, and a total embarrassment. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now we've got uh, our, our first guest today is uh, Richard Worshey Jr. And some of you know him as uh, White as White Boy Rick. Uh, and he is Rick has started. Uh, Rick served more than 32 years in prison. Uh, he's out now. He started a uh, cannabis company called The Eighth by White Boy Rick. And we'll have him explain what the origin of that is. So, Rick, welcome. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. Right. And, yeah. and thank you for uh, taking time out uh, to, to talk with us. Yeah. yeah. So, Rick, tell you know, so you've started this cannabis. Uh, you know, it's a it's a new field. Uh, tell us about how how do you get started in the cannabis business and how competitive? It seems like everywhere we see, we're seeing cannabis uh, out there. How how did how did you get started? How 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 do you start a cannabis business? Uh, I mean, for me, Alan, I had a lot of time before I got out, so I read a lot about it. I, I looked at the, the benefits of it as opposed to opioids. So I, I did a lot of research before I got out, a lot of, you know, right, reading and writing about it. And I wrote to some people, I talked to some people, and I just thought it was a good field for me to go into. It, it was, I'm not a regular nine to five person, as you right. you a long time i really don't want to sit behind the desk and work a regular job so right sure. kind of like right up my alley and i can do a lot of good things <laughs> through the community. where do you where do you where's your are you a wholesaler are you you distribute yeah, I'm a, it? i have a brand and, and i distribute to about 180 stores uh-huh hmm. and and uh, it just in michigan or all around the country uh i just launched in massachusetts okay and, and let me tell you, you I, obviously the white boy, we, there's two movies out there. There's a documentary and then there's a, the movie. So, uh, but I've still you, never watched the movie. You've never watched it. Oh, wow. And it's, the movie's not so great. The documentary is pretty, you this, the but documentary. Did they, consult, did they consult with you when they did the movie? They consulted with me for a long time. And uh, they actually... The, the guy that I, I worked probably 300 hours with, uh, Scott Silver, a dear friend of mine now, and he's the biggest writer in Hollywood now. He's he's actually wrapping up Joker 2. And a little bit later, we'll talk about the documentary that I'm working on now, but right. he's the biggest writer in Hollywood, and he signed on to produce my second documentary, so I'm excited about that. Let me ask you the the, the white boy Rick name. When you were in, when you were in prison... Some people complain. They said, don't call him White Boy Rick because it's making him sound more, more notorious, more better known. Uh, and now you're using it as a, as a it's a great brand name. How, 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 did, how do you feel about the, the name itself? Listen, of, of course, like when I meet people, even, you know, down here in Florida, I meet people and they're like, oh, White Boy Rick. But of course, my friends don't call me White Boy Rick. They call me right. Rick. Right. So. You know, it, it's something that I suffered from for, I believe, for three decades. So now if I can use it as a platform and use it to make some money and do good things at the same time, I don't have a problem with it. And you were never like, 
be, uh, you know, out on the streets, you were referred to as white boy, Rick. Was that uh, the media gave you that name or law enforcement or? We, Alan, you were in the media, so we all know who, who gave me the name and, and right. right. Okay. You know, it was it was for hype. I, I they had a they were persecuting all these you know young African American kids and 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 young adults and and they made me the poster child to say, see, we do it to white people too. Right. Yeah, yeah they, they sure did. Uh, uh, how? What would you tell? Uh, these young folks that's growing up and, and, and thinking that they they so slick that they can, you know, get away with the bullshit that they doing in Detroit. You know, it, it seems, and I came from the media too, it seems 20, 30, 40 years ago, there were some rules that uh, the, the drug folks I know and people that was on the street, and they had some rules. They didn't uh, shoot up houses. They didn't kill little kids. How do we stop a lot of this violence? You you serve you serve more than your share of time. How can you talk to some of these folks? Uh, you know, I work with this group called Team Wellness out of Detroit, and and it's a mental health facility. Yeah, it's very familiar. Yep. Fully integrated healthcare system. We don't turn away anyone. I'm very passionate about working with them. The CEO gave me a great opportunity. 30 days after I was home, he hired me. So we're now taking on, I think they're gonna give us half of the juveniles out of Wayne County that are locked up. So, you know, you, you can't take these kids and put them in a cage at 11 and 12 and 13 mm -hmm. years old and let them out and expect them to be normal. It, it just, it's not going to happen. You don't lock a child in a cell for 23 hours a day and let him out and, and think that he's going to function normal in society. And, and you're going to turn him into an animal. And that's what they're doing with our youth today. Yeah. There's no, yeah. you know, th this year, I, I love the city. I love the people. I don't always love the people that run it. I know that's not the political thing to say. I know they're trying to do their best job, but I'll give you an example. At the holidays, I, I try and do, I give ki bigger kids gifts because everybody does toys for tots. So a couple years ago, we started giving out sneakers to the bigger kids, the kids that are our size, that need a 10, an 11, a 12, a 13. So this year I said, I want to give every kid that's locked up in the youth home a pair of sneakers. And, and my brother, Danny Harani, who does so much in the city and so much he did 30 years in prison, was released because of the Second Chance Act. And I believe Judge Gerald Rosen released him for getting an education. And I mm -hmm. think he has three or four degrees. Uh, forgive me if I'm, he might have more. But we're still waiting for Wayne County to call us back. And Macomb County did theirs in one day. Right. Well, I do a lot of work in Wayne County. So, Rick, I know exactly what you're talking about. It, um, just to pivot a bit, did, did you find it ironic? You said when you got out, you were presented with this uh, opportunity to get into the marijuana business. Do you find it and ironic? It's probably, uh, I'm probably minimizing it. Um, do you find it ironic that the same thing that you were, was so, what you were accused of doing, now you can make a legal living doing, <laughs> you know, selling you know, drugs, basically. Do, how, how did how did that make you feel? Well, I, 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 marijuana, cannabis is not a drug. It's okay. a plant. So I consider drugs opioids. And, and I did an article yesterday with uh, Benzinga. Benzinga is one of the largest cannabis conferences that go on in, in right, America. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to for the next, uh, three days at it coming up here in Miami. So... It, me, cannabis can do so many good things in the world that people don't know about or, or, or are, you know, uh, illiterate to that, that if they just looked at it. And there's a reason these pharmaceutical companies are trying to break into the cannabis industry mm -hmm. because they know that it's coming and that it can be used. You don't need like all these opioids that, that, that hurt people. We have an epidemic right. in the country because of these pharmaceutical companies. And 
me will say, oh, you, you say this, but for me, a pharmaceutical company is nothing but a drug cartel operating in America. Right. Right. I agree with you. I agree with you. The, uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Five days ago, my partner, a good friend of his, got out of prison. Mm -hmm. uh, I think six or eight months ago, he was released. Forgive me, Gus, if I'm wrong, but it's, uh, you know, and, and they buried him four days ago, you know, from a fentanyl overdose. He, he was released from prison. He didn't get any treatment for drug addiction. They, they made him do his time. They threw him back out on the streets. He had opportunity, but drugs got the better of him. And, and you know, we go from one crisis to another with these, right. with these drug companies. First, they created Oxycontin or Oxycodone. Don't ask me for the life of me why we ever needed something that strong. That created an epidemic. Now they created this fucking fentanyl. And, and I know it's being made illegally now and brought over, but why did they create it in the first place? As society, we existed forever without oxycodone, without fentanyl. Now the government's allowing them to make these super powerful painkillers that are, they, they essentially are, they kill people. Rick, let me ask you how, in terms of the, your business now, how competitive is it out there? And, and how, do you, how do you keep the edge and, and stay in the game uh, with, with your company? What's, what, what, what does it take? Cannabis space itself is, is oversaturated, especially in Michigan. We yeah. gave out too many licenses. We gave out, uh, you know, I, I think it was just, it wasn't handled right from the beginning. I think the governor's trying to correct it now. And it's a good space. You can do a lot of good for me. I think my name in Michigan helps a lot. My brand helps a lot. And the meaning behind my brand and giving back from my brand helps a lot. Do you, have, do you have a grow license or just a packaging license or how does that work? I work through, uh, I have a couple of partners that, that uh, MKX Oil Company and Exclusive. Uh, Exclusive had the first license in the state of Michigan. So uh -huh. they've partnered with me to expand my line. And I have a full line now of, of I actually have flowers, pre-rolls, live resin vapes, disposable uh -huh. vapes and gummies. So for me, okay. you know, Alan, I get I could show you on Instagram where I get messages from 70, 70 year old or, or 75 year old ladies that, that have cancer. And they tell me how amazing my gummies are and what they do for them. And, and it makes me feel so good that, that right. you know, I think the message and it makes my day when I read that. Right. And now you also have some merchandise. I, I went on your website. Uh you have hats and T-shirts and all that stuff. The, the name of your website is uh, it's it's uh, the eighth by white the eighth by white boy Rick, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And so you're also working on uh, I, I you know when you right when you got out of prison, you start working on a documentary. How did that start, and and, and where's that going? What what do you? Uh, we started filming the day I walked out before there ever was a BMF series. Before there was anything, I, I, I believe, you know, I wore the free big meat shirt because I didn't believe that he deserved a 30 year sentence for a nonviolent drug crime. Right. So then I got involved in that. I, I appeared in uh, the BMF documentary, Blowing Money Fast. And we we filmed a week when I got out. We filmed a week uh, a year later. We just filmed some more. And as I said, Scott Silver it has signed on to produce. So. I think we'll do good. I think it'll be a, a, a real interesting series that'll show. I, I want to show people that after 30 years or three decades or more in prison, that you can still have a life. You can still do good things and you can do positive things. Okay. So, Rick, you said the documentary, uh, is, is it going to be a series? And if so, is, is the plan to have it on one of these um, platforms like Stars or Netflix or something like that? Uh, our, our plan is, you know, with the success, Netflix just bought the old documentary again for two years. A few weeks back, it was trending at number five. So they see the success of the old one. So we're hoping to land somewhere on, on a Netflix. Okay. okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll come back, Rick, if you can wait a minute and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Okay. Yep. All right. You want to roll? I'm Wayne County Treasurer Eric Sabri. There are payment plans available to help save your property. 
visit our website at treasurer.waynecounty.com or email us at taxinfo at waynecounty.com for further information. Homeownership opportunities are rising in the city of Detroit, and there's a house out there that's right for you and your family. You don't even have to worry about credit or getting a loan. You can win a house for as little as $1,000 and pay for the renovation cost as you go. It all starts at buildingdetroit.org and the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Our auction and own it now programs offer a variety of houses and neighborhoods all over the city of Detroit. These homes are in desperate need of repair and new ownership. You can begin by going to our interactive map and detailed property listings to find the right fit for you. It won't be easy, and renovation costs are not cheap, but our compliance team is there every step of the way. We will help you track your progress and connect you with local discounts to save you more money. We have already sold more than 15,000 homes in the city of Detroit, and our inventory is shrinking fast, so you don't want to miss out on this wonderful opportunity. Start your home buying journey today by visiting buildingdetroit.org. Hey, hey, Rick. Uh, we're gonna we have a couple more questions. One is, uh, can you explain to everyone uh, the meaning of the eighth? Why why the eighth? The eighth is the ban on cruel and unusual punishment. It's your Eighth Amendment on every bag and uh, everything I sell. The Eighth Amendment is printed. Hold on, I'll grab one real quick. Okay. Hold on. One okay. Yep. No yeah, problem I, there. So yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, somebody uh, uh, text me about uh opium say it's a plant oh it's not, it's not, yeah it's not, all right yeah okay oh, so yeah. we're we're back there but we're gonna yeah we're gonna uh talk to rick a little bit and uh wrap this up there you go rick well, dude, uh, oh this is a bag of my gummies uh-huh see on the back i don't know if you can see that the eighth amendment's printed yeah uh-huh so, Ah, interesting. Back cool. of every bag, it, 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 the Eighth Amendment is there as a, as a learning tool. I also have a little swag, man. A couple it's shot glasses. A, a it's and, it's and, 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 and right now, Alan, if people go into stores just to give back to someone, I, I hope someone in the city wins it. But I did kind of a Willy Wonka thing, and this is an advertisement. So they're specially marked Rolex bags. And I'm giving away my personal Rolex in the bag. So oh, okay. Very kind of, cool. you flip it around and there's a golden ticket, kind of like Willy Wonka. Uh-huh. And well, let me ask, let me ask you this question, Rick. Uh, I smoked uh, weed uh, 30, 40 years ago. And I, I just can't get get into it today because I don't like the smell. What's the difference? Is your <laughs> is your brand as good or what? And I don't want to eat anything that I uh, that you don't want any gummies? No, I don't want that. I, I like the re, I like the the stuff that I used to smoke in the day. <laughs> Listen, the, the the thing now is there's more science behind growing. There's there's the terpenes, the 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 THC. Like when we were kids, we really didn't know what we we were smoking. Shit that was coming across a border from Colombia or Mexico. Right. It was it was outdoor weed. Now you know you have these boutiques that grow. Some indoor, listen, I don't really smoke. I smoke on occasion. And I'll tell you this, there's some joints that I've hit one or two times. And, and it'll, it. I, don't I don't want that. that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that. Uh, I, I, okay. I, I, a couple of times I was on my buddy's boat and I, I told him, I said, man, I'm drunk as fuck. And <laughs> he looked at me and he goes, bro, you ain't drunk. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and it it's you know so you have to find there's there's everybody runs in the store and they go oh give me the highest thc oh no it's really not what you want those are people that that you know for the most part they don't know about the terpenes and this and that so mm -hmm. if you find something that that's if you just want a mellow high and you find something that's a hybrid that's like 18 to 20 percent thc and that it tastes good and that it smells good I think you're. I think that's more of what we used to smoke back in the day. Right. Higher quality, but but a much better weed. Well, I, I want our listeners saying uh, that opium is a plant. You know, so you opium know. opium's a plant that 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 has to be refined into a drug. Yeah. Like 
Uh, cocoa's a plant. It has to be refined right. in cocaine. You have to. Yeah. Right. right. Well, well anyway, right. man, and Rick, we really enjoyed uh, uh, the interview today, and, and, and thanks for taking time out. Right. And, and I just want to tell anyone who's interested, uh, it's the 8th by White Boy Rick. That's the name of the website. Uh, the product, if you, I guess if you go to the site, you can find retailers uh, where, you, where you can buy uh, Rick's uh, product there. So, Rick, thanks. Thanks right. so much. Rick, before you leave, I'm going to ask you to do us a favor. Go okay. on our web. Uh, make sure your people look at Detroit in black and white every Saturday at 10 <laughs> o'clock. Go on our YouTube page. Like. Subscribe. Share and notify. Okay. I'll, I'll put our social media guy on it. I'm not the uh, most happy. I can get yeah. through some things, but yeah, All most, right. most people are. Most people are. But thanks, thanks a lot, Rick. We really appreciate it. Good thanks luck for with, thanks. Yeah, I'm, good I'm, luck with the business. And I'll, like I say, anybody I'll, who wants, it's the eighth by White Boy Rick. That's the name of the website, and you can find products, including merchandise like the T-shirt that Rick is uh, currently wearing. So. Or you Go get a, a white boy Rick grilled cheese at Mongo's. Oh, that's right. That's right. You know, that's his brother. <laughs> I know I know that. So I shout out I, I tell him I said thank you. I, I you don't know how many pictures and, and emails and even while I was in prison, people would tell me, Hey, they got a sandwich named after you at Mongo's. <laughs> that's funny. So all well, right. Have, have a great weekend. Guys. Take care. Thank, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Look, Talking Larry again. know how to promote. Oh, yeah. Larry's, a, Larry's, Larry's <laughs> an entrepreneur. He's got the Mongo family, man. Entrepreneurs there, man. And no stocks, no uh, stocks. So, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> that was great. But, uh, so, all right. So, we have uh, coming up. Uh, well, we, we, we're from the Detroit Land Bank. We got uh, uh, Randy Scott, uh, okay. the deputy director. All right. You know, you know, they've been in the news a little bit, uh, you know. The land bank is the land bank, but right. you know what? The land bank doing some 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 good things, mm -hmm. some great things in the city. And, and, and let me say this: before you know, you jump on a hot story, and before you, as an elected official, decide that you're going to carry somebody's water for you them, make it. sure you got the facts right. Make sure you got all the facts right. And that the water is okay. not poisoned. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So. Yeah. You know, I, I actually had in my uh, in, in my building that I live in in Midtown, the water, I, I have one of those purifiers on the faucet now, mm -hmm. but when you run the regular water, it was cloudy and I, I was concerned about that. And they were telling me in the building, oh, they're probably just working on something. And I think that's what it was because it cleared up. But uh, I mean, people always talk about Detroit's water as being great. Uh, so Hopefully that is the case. Uh, so, uh, so we're waiting for the, the guests. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about uh, about the the Illich uh, pro project. Well, well you know what? I, 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 listen, I, I I like what's going on downtown. A lot of stuff is happening, but when you drive, and I and and and, and I have to drive a lot of times because you got to let reality set in. Parts of Detroit is so bad that how can we as residents of this city allow this shit to happen? You can go somewhere, you get one house on the street uh, here, one house there, or uh, you got five uh, burnout houses here, and then you got a house with somebody, uh, you know they own it because the grass is manicured, <laughs> right. no trash around, and they sitting on a they sitting on a, a, a street. You know it's full of rats and what other rodents. That's but the other part of here. this is this: when people complain and say, "Hey, you're only concentrating on downtown Detroit. You're only concentrating in certain areas." To me, when you pass this kind of, when you say you give somebody a pass and say, "Hey," you can use as much money as you want because we are allowing you to. To me, it gives credence to those people who feel like, listen, we're being left out. You guys aren't considering us. You can and go, that, that is, that is, you that can, is the you reality. Go, you can go to Dearborn, Melvindale, Westland, and you see these old houses 
but you see nice, clean streets, manicured uh, yards and stuff, and then you ride down in Detroit, and the shit looks like it don't even well, look like Lebanon. Well, you Lebanon know what? You know, you know what the thing is, which is really I to shouldn't me, laugh because you're right. <laughs> you know, you know what's it's it's fascinating to me is that we have become so accustomed. Like I drive down Woodward in Detroit and go through Highland Park. And you see some of the blight and the boarded up buildings. When you li- when I lived in D.C., probably the whole city, there were maybe three boarded up stores. There were no abandoned homes. There were maybe a couple abandoned apartment buildings, which were eventually rehab. But here in the city, we have become so used to it. So when somebody from another city comes to Detroit, they're like, holy shit, look at this place. It's decimated. You go down Grand River, you go down Oakland, you go down Hamilton. It's like it, it's never recovered from the riots. Uh, you know, since 67, some of these areas have never been, they've never made a comeback. Grand River, you know, we have 16th and Grand River where we have suddenly a bakery and we've had a restaurant come up there. And my father had a bar at 14th and Grand River that area became a dead zone for almost 50 years, and now we see it. But we have become so used to it. When I moved back from D.C. and I was driving down Woodward, I was like, oh, my God, how ugly this, how blighted, how, how dreary this is. And now I drive and I'm like with blinders. I just ignore it. It just becomes part of the, the landscape that we accept. And that's what happens. I was, you know, last month. Going to the east side, or is it is do we accept, or is it that the people that we put in office get, we gonna, choose to ignore all of us? Like okay. All of us, choose it's to not, ignore. it's, it's not are the people, give, choose to gonna, ignore what the people give, want. If I'm gonna give you 800 fucking million dollars, I, I should have a whole list. I, I, I'm not begging you to uh make the residents a part of this shit right. but demanding that before you get a a, 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 a fucking dime that you got a game plan for for a, a neighborhood a school uh groceries you know what if you're gonna give somebody like Illich or Tom Gores or whoever uh that kind of money I, Fine, give it to them. But if they gonna say, I, I got five neighborhoods, I'm, I'm redeveloping, I'm building up a new school, I'm done, whatever. They they don't demand shit Listen, from these it, But in this case, the problem is this. You came and you got from the trough before, and you said that you were going to do X, Y, and Z, and you didn't. No. So why is it that it's okay for you to come back and say, now... Why would I think that money. your word? Yeah. Why would I even think that your word means anything at all? Why do? Why would that's, I trust that, you? That's why we. Why? Give, that's, why? That's why we give billionaires money. We trust them that they're going to do it. And, and, and as as Bill Cycle yesterday on our show, the week that was, a little plug there, uh, he said, and he was involved. He's been involved in some of these things, and he said there needs to be uh, milestones. That you do this, you do that as you promised, and you get that money. If you and don't you do this, you should get the money in increments. You yeah, should just, I and, mean, it's and just. And you don't get, you don't, you don't do this milestone. You don't reach this milestone. You don't build. All bets are on. Tom Gore's got and you don't get money. dollars uh, to build that facility, and he gave the city of Detroit a basketball court. God <laughs> damn, man. You know what? That's, but we allowed. Another that. billionaire who's had his hand out, and as I pointed out before, in, in San Francisco, the Golden State Warriors, when they moved their arena from Oakland to San Francisco, I think it was about a $1.4 billion arena, all privately funded, all of it privately funded. There was another arena, uh, all privately funded from California. The Palace uh, was funded, $90 million private money. Look, these guys, these guys, these guys aren't putting out their money either. They're going to banks. They're getting the loans, you know, they're getting the tax breaks. Uh, well, my, my question is this. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you this question. I, I'm serious. Why is it that council continue to delay the decision that we ultimately... Wanna, they what, what, be, was it, <laughs> was it, be, was it smoke and mirrors? Yeah, it was. It, it, it was. And so residents of the city of Detroit... It was a ruse. It was smoke and mirrors. And guess what? We always talk about accountability. 
we need to hold these people accountable. Well, right. we I'm being corrected in saying it's the Detroit Rebellion, not the Detroit uh, riot. I, I started to say it, but I didn't want to cut I, you off. I'm old sentence. school. It was, you know, forever called the Detroit riot. But and, it wasn't a riot. No. Yeah. It, 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 you know, well, especially when you had all these young black men coming home from Vietnam. And they wasn't they, they wasn't gonna let the police beat their ass like yeah. uh, like their fathers. But anyway, if to end this subject, the Detroit Lions say they're gonna uh, build a new facility, training facility, mm-hmm. but they can't find any uh, vacant land. Oh, I I'll, I'll find leave, it. I, I well, leave, I'll well, leave it at that. No, yeah. we'll, say that's not true. You know what they could do? They could knock down that church at well, Seven and Woodward. <laughs> Let's, let's take a break and do uh, 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 the land bank commercial, and then we'll be right back. Nearly 30,000 vacant lots all over the city of Detroit are for sale right now. That's right. Nearly 30,000 vacant lots are available now, starting at just $100. The lot next to your house or the lot down the street. Make it yours today in just a few simple clicks. Find out if it is available by visiting buildingdetroit.org. At the Detroit Land Bank Authority, side lots are just $100 and neighborhood lots sell for $250. You can apply and pay online today by visiting buildingdetroit.org. And if you don't see the lot you're looking for, call our offices. Our phone number is 313-974-6869. Again, that is 313-974-6869. We have already sold more than 21,000 vacant lots to Detroit homeowners. Make today your turn by visiting buildingdetroit.org. Okay, okay. that's fine. All right. Okay. All righty. Okay, well, we, 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 we talked about that, but we got somebody that's going to talk about the uh, Detroit Land Bank. Uh, the deputy uh, director, we have had him on uh, when we were doing radio, mm-hmm. and uh, he can give us the 411 on what's going on. Reginald Scott, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Oh, we everyone. can't hear you, man. There we go. Hey. How you doing, hey. man? I'm great. How about you? How y'all doing, doing this morning? Doing great, man. I, I see y'all been in the news a little lately, man. <laughs> What's going yeah. on? Well, you know what? It's I'm going to just go right to it, man. It's some ridiculousness. It's, it is attempting to be in the news but not talk about anything. You, we've been in the news about this Occupy program, our our occupied and and it was a horrible totally misguided interview with someone who is living or occupying some of the land bank property so let me give you a little context about this i've been with the land bank for seven years this april 6th and when i started i started out with dispositions and one of our programs that i was most i would say proud about because of its people first approach was our occupy program so let's, let's kind of set the record straight on a few things. The one thing that was said that really got under my skin that just like rubbed me the wrong way this week was the land bank doesn't care about the people who are living yeah, in this house, which is the furthest thing from the truth, Vanessa. And the reason why I say that is I because that. Anytime, anytime we have a house that we suspect to be occupied, if we have the suspicion of it, if we go by and do a survey and it looks like somebody is there, we don't list that house for sale. We don't list those structures for sale. But... You got to understand this. These are not people who are living in the house that like bought it or they've been residing in it. These are for lack, absolutely, for lack of better terms, they're squatters. And not only are they squatters, but in addition to that, these homes are in deplorable conditions. So when we decide that we want to sell them or we attempted to sell them to a nonprofit, we're attempting to sell them to a nonprofit so that we can get them a better quality of life and a better home to live in man i mean like so this is so real to me because we deal with it every day and we've been doing this program like i said for six years and in that time over 1100 people have actually been able to go through the occupy program whereby they demonstrate that they have some connection to the property should be it like their their family was owning the property or they had a lease on the property and the landlord didn't own it or something like that with those people, we see the connection to the property. We take them through a year of working with a nonprofit to save money, and we sell them the house, and we teach them how to pay their taxes to be a responsible homeowner. 
Why, Man, did, why, why, Man, didn't, Man. Uh, why didn't Mary Waters come Man. to y'all and say, you know what, Man. I got a, a, a person calling me and, and, and this is the scenario. What it's gamesmanship. Doing? It's gamesmanship. And you know, exactly. because when I tell you that the example that they used, if they could, they couldn't have picked a worse example Re of the Reggie. structure that they chose. Yes. Reggie, Reggie, yes. Uh, when I read yes. the story, uh, when I read the story, I'm like, okay, so you, for 17 years, you took care of this property. This predates the your tenure. It predates yes. Yes. Tammy's tenure. Right. Really? So gonna, and so then the gonna, other one, I'm, I'm like, a, where's the lease yeah. agreement? Who, yeah, I'm gonna add, I was just about to ask you that. Where's I was just about to ask you that question. How do you, as a as a elected official, jump on a bandwagon without even lining up your facts? Yes, Vanessa. And and the thing of it is, is like with those homes, I mean, this is where like our hands are tied and we need to work in partnership with the city versus playing this game. This is like that house in particular. We have been vetting that person since 2017. So when we say vet, we're trying to find a way that you can show you have a connection to the property so we can sell it to you and inspect it so we can know that we're not selling you just this albatross. Since 2017, that individual has not been able to provide any sufficient documentation because to show their connection to the property because there's no connection. Now, let me tell you what else is going on when we talk about the need and not laying this at the land bank's foot like this is something that the land bank did there have been five police calls to that home five since 2017. child protective services has been called two instances of pit bull dog mauling to people in the neighborhood dog mauling so the safety and well-being of seven children children neighbors the state of the house, the police being called there, all of those things are things that are happening at that particular house, but yet and still, it's a story of accusing the land bank of not working with individuals. It's ridiculousness. It, we have uh, hundreds of pages of documentation of how we try to work with every individual who identifies themselves. And to make it seem, yet, like to make that credible, just think about it. If somebody is living somewhere that they know they haven't been paying them, mortgage, rent, utilities, or anything like that in five to seven years, is it really like they're going to be like, yes, I've done everything right. I mean, come on. Let's, I mean, let's be, let's, be, let's be honest here. This is a social services issue that is being laid at the feet of the land bank, and it's, and it's incorrect. That is, that is, if we're going to do this right, and we're going to work with the city, and we're going to work on this, we got to work on this stuff right, and we got to be real about it. This ain't a let land bank issue. Right. Let me say this, Reggie. In my opinion, that we all know that poverty is a real issue in the city of Detroit. And this, this is probably a poverty issue, right? And so you have this mom there with Absolutely. these kids and yeah. CPS involved yeah. and all of that. Listen, we understand that you need somewhere to live. We understand that, right. you know, you need somewhere for your kids to live. We, we get all of that. But to right. me, as an elected official, you don't go after the entity without, yeah. yep. as I, mean, I said before, getting all the facts. If you want right. to be helpful right. to these families, say, hey, Use your connections and say, hey, uh, we're going to call social services, get you hooked up with somebody. Do you know somebody that can help them with this? Or right. even make the call to the land bank and say, hey, yeah. she doesn't have this paperwork. How can we get around this? But yeah. instead, and, and you, you have this, this, this so, article, these so articles Vanessa, in, the news and, in the news. It's, it's ridiculous. So let me jump on that right there. So this is where the whole issue really came from. This is some like behind the scenes. Why this is an issue is because if the person does not, to your very good point, if the person does not own the property or have a connection to the property, we don't try to put them out. What we did with this particular property that they, they went in front of was we referred it to an occupied nonprofit partner. And what that is is someone who has the resources and the ability to come in, fix up the house, A, but B, work with that resident or that individual who is squatting who is there to see if they can come up with an agreement on, on moving forward and that they don't lose occupancy. So here's the thing. We have an individual who is working in that neighborhood, in that footprint, who has been doing great work with the land bank for the last four years. So how our pro process works is that 
if someone wants to acquire more than nine properties or parcels of land, we work in conjunction with the city of Detroit and we send them to be vetted by city council because we want city council to approve a land transfer or nine or over. So this individual entity, this nonprofit entity wants 26 occupied properties mm -hmm. and the rest vacant. But this is the thing. He wants those 26 and has shown a pattern and has shown a history of being able to work with these individuals, employ individuals in the neighborhood, employ returning citizens to get these properties fixed up and get them occupied. He's doing great work. He is, th these individuals like him come few and far between because can you imagine having to go into a property and try to deal with someone who has been off the radar for all of that time? So he's been successful. We've been vetting him. We've been watching him for four years. And now we're like, hey, let's take it. Let's take it to city council. Let's do a larger transfer so you can really have some impact in this neighborhood that needs it. But now I'm just being honest. This is Reginald talking on a Saturday. The All politics right. came into play. And right. then now the politics are in play because somebody doesn't like it and somebody this. So now they want to make a big deal as if the land bank is doing something about, oh, my God, they're selling occupied properties. Yes, we are. We've been doing that all along because we need somebody to go in and be able to help remediate the problem. Like we have about 1,900 properties that are sitting in the status of what we call suspected to be occupied. Of those that we've surveyed, about 500 of them we believe strongly should be demolished, but you can't demolish them with someone in it. So we're working trying to figure out ways to deal with the people first and deal with the property last. But it is not a land bank issue. You know, the land bank just ends up with the property in its inventory by virtue of the, the property transferring to us. But well, we're not just it. like, okay, let's sell it. We're like, let's figure out how we deal with these individuals who are in there. Well, and I just want to be a part. That's what I was just going to say. They're going to pick up, they're going to beat up on the land bank, but yet you're going to vote to give the Illiches all this money. <laughs> man, and man. they have not done anything. <laughs> To, and to I mean, shoot, support it all. Get out of here. Support it all ways. I, I mean, have I'm a like, seat. This. like, yeah, like, how, Take how, do you have a your, how do you beat up your partner publicly about something that they know unequivocally that we're working hard on? Yeah, like, you know, I, I, I like I heard it in the pack, but you know, I, I'll deal with the demo it's stuff. Good yeah, right, right. Get, get right. The political point. Uh, uh, and, and thanks for coming on and and, yeah. um, and, and, and clearing the air. Uh, how do uh, someone who want to get a house or a vacant lot or whatever contact the land bank? They, sh they, sh they can contact the land bank by logging on to our website. That's www.buildingdetroit.org. And they can also reach out to us at 313-974-6869. Because, you know, like Adolph, when I talked to you, when we came on before, I was like, our properties are selling. We are selling the properties and we're trying to make sure that we get people in those properties, get them occupied. But let's talk about it. The real challenge is this. Detroiters um, who are buying these properties and Detroiters, period, lack resources. So I'm glad that they are implementing programs, you right. know, zero percent loans to get people, you know, some help when they need it. Like we have people who are working paycheck to paycheck to fix it up and we're trying to work along with them. We don't want the property back because all we got to do is we're going to do is sell it to somebody else. But you know, like this type of conversation right here, this type of stuff, you know, they don't want to, because this is too much like the right way to do it. They give you those little sound bites and like the land bank is putting people out and not allowing people to opportunity to buy the house, which is the furthest thing from the truth. We, our only programs are to help people get back in them. We need to really do more, but we need the ability to refer somebody to something. When you, got, when you go in the house and you got people that say, I'm going to sick my pit bull on you if you come to my door and they know they're living in a property that they don't own, there's an issue beyond the scope right. of what the land bank does. Right. 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 It really is. It's a danger to society. Minister, yeah, yeah, yeah. Red, it Red, is. but before you go, uh, mm -hmm. please explain again how people can get involved in the program with the nonprofit that you guys partner with. Oh, we uh oh, lost we voice. lost your voice. All right. Well, okay. Well, okay. Right. okay. Okay, I'm here. I, we got a connection issue. Say, explain again. What? I'm sorry. Explain. You were talking about that you partner with this nonprofit. So, if anybody's mm -hmm. watching this show, if they oh, yeah. are in the neighborhood or in the area right. uh, where there's a house that's available, how do they get connected with the nonprofit? 
so they can with, they can again contact the um, land bank and they can ask about our Occupy nonprofit program. Okay. And we because we're looking for you know it doesn't have to just be nonprofit. It's just be for profit nonprofit, but an organization that has the resources a but b history in providing some outreach services or research you know resources and then secondly the you know financial ability and the wherewithal and some form of a track record that you've worked with rehabbing dilapidated you know dilapidated homes that are similar to what we have in our inventory and we'll okay. figure you know we'll figure out a way to work with you let me give because hey i I want these programs to be successful so i can give out my email address but also and phone uh, my number. contact and my phone number at the land bank. So let me start okay. with my email address. Okay. It is R Scott, R S C O T T, at DetroitLandBank.org. And the phone number, my phone number, my office line is 313 261 9993. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. And Reg, we're going to ask so you to do us a favor. Be, uh, um, when you get off, make sure you spread the word that Detroit okay. Black and White is doing uh, live every Saturday on Facebook. We're also on YouTube. We're asking Absolutely. people to go to our YouTube channel, like, subscribe, and hit the notification button. Okay. I sure will. I sure All will. Right. It's a pleasure always. It's always a pleasure talking to you guys. Hey, All right. Thanks, Reg. Thanks very Okay. Much. You're welcome. I'll talk yeah, to you soon. Yeah. All right. Reginald Scott. Okay. All right. So we got to play a little land bank uh, commercial, and then we're going to bring on uh, former U.S. attorney from D.C., uh, Roscoe Howard. Homeownership opportunities are rising in the city of Detroit, and there's a house out there that's right for you and your family. You don't even have to worry about credit or getting a loan. You can win a house for as little as $1,000 and pay for the renovation cost as you go. It all starts at buildingdetroit.org and the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Our auction and own it now programs offer a variety of houses and neighborhoods all over the city of Detroit. These homes are in desperate need of repair and new ownership. You can begin by going to our interactive map and detailed property listings to find the right fit for you. It won't be easy, and renovation costs are not cheap, but our compliance team is there every step of the way. We will help you track your progress and connect you with local discounts to save you more money. We have already sold more than 15,000 homes in the city of Detroit, and our inventory is shrinking fast, so you don't want to miss out on this wonderful opportunity. Start your home buying journey today by visiting buildingdetroit.org. And it says live video. All right, we're okay. talking to. Now we learn. We we learning. Uh, the ex, we got an ex U.S. attorney Roscoe Howard. We're waiting on him to get a video, right, uh, yeah. Joe? Yeah, but anyway, now as we will, you brought up something that made a whole lot of sense. Uh, Mary Waters beat up on the fucking land bank, and without getting her facts straight. But yet she vote for eight hundred million dollars. I mean, uh, to me, how do you? Oh, how do you? Uh, uh, for me, how do you uh, reconcile that? How does that even make sense? I'm for the look. I'm for yeah. the poor people. I'm for these people that is getting right. beat up on. But yet we're gonna get these. I'm gonna help you write this check to these people. That to me just does not make sense. It, it does not. That's. It does not. But that's when that, that that's when I say. Uh, if I'm going to use this woman as, as a poster yeah, child, yeah, gotcha. I'd have said, Mr. Illich, All right. Mr. Illich, you see what we're dealing with in the neighborhood? Absolutely. Okay. So you use gonna... your leverage. That's right. You use your leverage. This is what we're dealing with. In so, what are you going to do in the neighborhood? All right. Well, we'll see. We got, we, we got video. All right. We got video, Joe. All right. You yeah. want to bring him on? Uh, yeah, we'll do ahead. an intro, you... and then we're going to. Hey, Roscoe, there he is. Hey, how uh, are you? Good, good. Hi, Thanks Roscoe. so much. Roscoe was, I'll just give you a quick little intro and we're going to play a quick little video that's because we're going to be talking about Trump. But Roscoe, uh, when I was at the Washington Post, he was the uh, U.S. attorney in D.C. from 2001 to 2004. He now works for the law firm Barnes and Thornburg, correct? That's correct. Uh, all right. And then we're going to play. We're going to talk to Roscoe about Roscoe knows the inner workings of D.C. and about indictments. And stuff. We're going to talk to him about the Trump indictment and what can we expect and uh, with all these investigations going on. But we're going to play a little video first. You got that, Joe? The Kimmel? 
I haven't heard Joe say thank you, President Trump, for the great job you did. Perhaps I'm just not listening. Now NATO's stuffed up with cash. Thank you very much, President Trump. Shut the f*** up! Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so Roscoe, the, the, the question is, we've got, we, we've got the indictment now here. We don't know. It, there's a lot of counts. It seems to me, what, what's your thoughts? I mean, the, the, the core, or at least the core investigation we had to do with uh, the payoff to Stormy Daniels, but 31 counts, is there some, do you think there's obstruction, uh, wit, witness tampering? What, what, what's your just total conjecture on that? Uh, it'd be total conjecture. I don't know that anybody yeah. knows the number of counts. It, uh, I think on, I believe it's Tuesday that Trump will be arraigned. Um, di- indictments are usually sealed right after they are um, uh, passed by the uh, uh, by the grand jury. The whole proceedings are secret. Uh, right. There's a reason for that. A lot of people look at it as kind of evil, but there's a reason for it. And um, uh, and there may be a leak or something like that. But right now, Alan, pure conjecture. My guess is that um, every time he passed a check, there was a count. Uh, that's probably the way the statute uh, reads. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is not uncommon for prosecutors to do that. Uh, it, it simplifies things. One, for the jury, uh, a pettit jury, once there's a trial. Two, it, it reflects the actual um, crime so that uh, when you see most indictments, uh, they basically read like a story. You can read through an indictment and you can see exactly what somebody's done. And ordinarily what they'll do is you'll have a number of dates written down. And on this date, X, Y, and Z check was passed. Uh, it was given to uh, this attorney on another date and given to um, uh, and given to the, uh, uh, the the person who took it on, on another date. And uh, and they're easy. They, they're made to be easy to read through because ordinarily they're given to a pettit jury at a trial. They want a jury to understand it. So my guess is there are probably a count for every time he passed a check. My guess is there is also a, um, a count for um, for uh, each one of the um, uh, different times that they've tried to hide it. Uh, so there would be an obstruction light count. But until we see it, everything's a guess. And, uh, we, we need you to do us a favor. We need sure. you to turn around. I need you to look at me. There you go. <laughs> the thing is, I've got you over here. There we go. Right, right. Perfect. Right. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I, I, so I got a question here, Roscoe. You look good, so I have to look at you. So I have to, to do it. Well, look at me. Look at look at me. <laughs> so so Roscoe, let me ask let me ask you this. Yeah. We have investigations. We have this one investigation now that's come to fruition as an indictment. Yeah. We have we have the DC, the Justice Department investigation going yeah. on on the January 6th. We have another investigation going with the documents in Florida. And then yep. we have the Fulton County investigation, which is another state case. Yes. Uh, is there any, you know, people, some people were saying, oh, the, the Stormy Daniel thing is minor compared to the other. Do you think there's any behind the scenes? Like, why don't you guys hold off? Or, or is everyone just going at their own pace? Is there any coordination going on with all these? Is the Justice Department trying to uh, my, my guess is there is probably ordinarily, let me step back. Ordinarily, no, there is no coordination. Um, or, ordinarily, each district takes it as the crimes come. Uh, sometimes uh, states will coordinate with the feds because the, uh, the feds have uh, a, a larger arsenal. There are things right. that, that the federal government can do that a state can't. And so ordinarily, they will hold off for the state. But I think each at the ground level, each prosecutor is looking at their case as their case. Right. And um, and I, I got to tell you, at this point, indicting the president has just never happened. So, um, so precedented. I, I'd be a little surprised if the people at the top of Merrick Garland, uh, the attorney general for uh, New York and the attorney general for um, uh, the state of uh, Georgia haven't talked to one another about where are you? What are you going to do? Uh, I, I would really be surprised if they're saying, let me go first, uh, because it is. Um, each one has a different interest. I mean, the state of New York is going to be very, very protective of their of their laws, their people, and uh, crimes committed there. The state of Georgia is going to be the same way, and the federal government is going to be the federal government. I think they've got a, a, a longer process. They may have more uh, crimes involved because they're the federal government. I mean, you still have to address roles and things like uh, the January, you know, January six and. And Trump uh, making the initial call to come and whether he should be 
uh, held accountable for that. And all that's being done under one special prosecutor. So um, my guess is they've talked. I doubt that they are coordinating. But, Alan, at right, na right now, um, I think that's one of those things we will learn in, in a documentary that comes after everything's done. Because oh, oh, this, this, this everything sounds like be very careful. This sounds like it's going to take years to get this guy. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, say it again. I it's not it. like we're going to be going through this process for years. Well, the rules of justice are slow. The rules of justice are slow. Well, the justice is slow and it's not slow. For instance, um, I, I don't know the uh, the rules in New York, but I'll tell you this. Uh, the, the, the federal rule is that once somebody is indicted, they are supposed to be tried within 70 days. 70 days from the day of an, uh, of an indictment. And um, and when indictments are returned and they go to the court and somebody comes in to plead guilty and uh, the districts I've practiced in, what the, um, what the federal government does, and keep in mind, the federal rules are the same in Washington as they are in Detroit, as they are in Los Angeles. The federal rules don't change. And so uh, the first thing the judge does is pull out a calendar, count out 70 days. They say, can you be ready on the 70th day? And then they start counting in. Uh, and that's when they set trial. One of the reasons trials are set out so long is that there are some things that are taken away from those 70 days. So if somebody files a motion, that will add time to the clock. But in theory, there's supposed to be 70 days. So it's not one of these situations that indictments uh, passed. Now the statute of limitations no longer becomes an issue. So the crime is going to be good until the government uh, can bring it or until the court orders it, orders it to bring it. And in the federal government, the rule is supposed to be seventy days. What do you what do you see as all these? And, and I know you you you're you're looking uh, from outsider here at the at this point. But what do you see as do you see any cases a stronger case, whether it's the Fulton County one or the document case of Mar-a-Lago? If you were the prosecutor, and just what information you know, is there a case that you would say, "I'll take that one. I think I can get a conviction." Uh, you know, it's um, I, I can't tell you that I or anybody really understands everything that uh, people have seen in any of these grand juries or in any case. For instance, in the Fulton County uh, matter, there have been some phone calls that have come up that I don't believe the public had heard. Uh, and um, and I'll, I'll, I'll be frank with you, Alan, you probably know this from your days in, in Washington on the cases we've had. If we've got a phone call, oh, we'll play that in a minute. Um, mm -hmm. If we got a video, we will play that in a minute. Uh -huh. And um, and you have that, you know, and it's easier to have your opening statement be part of you, boom, pushing a button and hearing the defendant's voice. Yeah. Because in, in ordinary circumstances, the defendant will, yeah, well, they do have a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate themselves, not even at trial. And so if you notice at any trial, you never, ever, ever see a prosecutor calling the defendant because they can't. Uh, they could, but that would <laughs> the trial would be over. And you can rarely see a defendant uh, taking the stand, mainly because they're not always sure what the government has in their in, in its pocket. But if you've got their voice on tape and the jury can hear them, especially hear hear them saying something incriminating. Oh, yeah, you play that. You play that in a minute. Uh, let the jury understand who they're dealing with, what they're dealing with and how they are. And keep in mind, in Fulton County, you don't know everything that they've had. I'm going to bet that the same thing's happening in New York. That you've got, um, you, you've got uh, Michael Cohen, and um, uh, you know he is he was an insider, as I understand it. And you've got checks, and once you can pull out pull out evidence that's other than testimony, and it's not to denigrate testimony. Testimony is very important, but it's just like anything. I mean, you know, your listeners can think about it. If you can just think of a a a, a, um, uh, a uh, just any time that's important to your life, say your kid's birthday or your own birthday. And then sit around with people and try to remember what everybody was wearing on that day. I will, I will guarantee you, not everybody will get it right, or at least they won't get it uh, uh, the same. But right. when you can pull out a video, a phone call, anything that the jury can look at or put their hands on, it's uh, from a prosecutor standpoint that's evidentiary gold. Ros Roscoe, let me ask you. Uh, you know, everyone's thought about this. Do you think Trump could actually get prison time if convicted on some of these? Uh, various cases? Well, the conviction is always the first part. And, um, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and he's an unusual guy. I mean, uh, if, if you think about it, I mean, he's, uh, you know, run for president uh, twice. Uh, 
from, from a popular standpoint, lost both times, but still got to serve. He clearly has a base. Um, and, um, uh, and I think in some districts, he might have a little problem because the districts didn't go for him. I don't know. He'll have more supporters in a jury pool, I would imagine, in Georgia than he does in, in New York. And certainly more than he would have if he's indicted here in Washington, D.C. But, um, you, you know, it is it, it's just tough to say, you know, former presidents just don't fit on the sentencing guidelines for any state or, or, the, or the feds. And I think that um, a lot of it will uh, depend on on what the jury hears. But could he get jail time? I think each one of these crimes does carry jail time. Does the judge have an ability to go? Below that and not get below what the, the guidelines give you a range that somebody should be when I say should be that that um, that the uh, that Congress has decided in, in the federal uh, case. Uh, this is what somebody who committed these crimes and has certain factors. Uh, this is what they should serve. But a judge has the uh, ability as long as they can explain it to go below that. Yes. And certainly yes. prosecutors can argue above that. And without a doubt, defense attorneys will argue below that. And could they get it? Yeah, I think I, I think he could. I, I don't think it's uh, it's an impossibility. Um, All right. Well, we'll we time will tell, as they say. Yeah. Right, Roscoe, thanks so much for it. It's great seeing you. Absolutely. Uh, hope to see you in person uh, sooner than later. Good. Uh, so, anyways, thanks thanks again for Anytime. providing your expertise, and uh, we'll talk to you later. We'll have you on again if yeah. you're willing. Thanks for coming on. So, thanks. Glad to be on. Thank you. Thanks right. for the invitation. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Bye. 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 Okay. Take care. Commercial. We go to the all right, a little break here, a little commercial. Nearly 30,000 vacant lots all over the city of Detroit are for sale right now. That's right, nearly 30,000 vacant lots are available now, starting at just $100. The lot next to your house or the lot down the street. Make it yours today in just a few simple clicks. Find out if it is available by visiting buildingdetroit.org. At the Detroit Land Bank Authority, side lots are just $100 and neighborhood lots sell for $250. You can apply and pay online today by visiting buildingdetroit.org. And if you don't see the lot you're looking for, call our offices. Our phone number is 313-974-6869. Again, that is 313-974-6869. We have already sold more than 21,000 vacant lots to Detroit homeowners. Make today your turn by visiting buildingdetroit.org. Well, what's this supposed to happen? Jason Rose. Hello, sir. How you doing? I'm all right, man. <laughs> A lot's been happening since the last time I saw you. Uh, you know, it's never dull in Michigan. If, if something <laughs> if it's boring, just give it a day. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. And, and we had uh, talked about... Uh, and stabbing our seat, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you what you thought of this indictment against the former president. Well, uh, Donald Trump has no better friends than his enemies. Um, yeah. Everything they do just seems to strengthen him and I think enhance his possibilities of getting the Republican nomination, unfortunately. Does this hurt the Republicans in uh, Michigan? Uh, it hurts it Republicans. It doesn't hurt Trump, but Trump's never much cared about Republicans. Right. <laughs> what you saying? He's not a real Republican, huh? Well, he just, I mean, listen, he was a Democrat before he decided to run for president as a Republican. He was whatever he needed to be when it was convenient to be it. And, you know, I don't think he's a, a conservative steeped in uh, conservative ideology and, and thinking about these things. I think when he became president, he surrounded himself with some uh, conservative ideologues that guided him. And, and I think, you know, you wear that cape long enough and you start to uh, internalize the, the ideals of, of that, the party you're wearing the cape for. So, you know, I would say, you know, he thinks like a conservative today, but I don't think he gives a damn about the Republican Party and the, and the prospects of Republican candidates or the party itself. Jason, go ahead, go ahead, Reverend. So, Jason, so you have some Republicans, and we were talking about this this morning, who are you? You know, you have Lindsey Graham who's saying let's raise some money for this guy's defense. Or, you know, first of all, I, we I know, thought that's what he's been doing for the last yeah, six years. Myself, right. <laughs> it's it's an indictment. We don't know what's going to happen, um, but you have that, and then you have uh, Mitch McConnell who hasn't said anything at all. And then you have 
you know, the Democrats, you have some that are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think that, you know, my opinion, those Democrats need to just be quiet and just let things play out. What's your take on it? Um, well, listen, I think smart. Well, it depends. I mean, I, I think Democrats probably are cheering this because anything that improves Trump's opportunities of getting the Republican nomination improves Democrats uh, possibilities in the 2024 election cycle. Um, you know, I, I know we're going to talk a bit about the Michigan Senate race, but of the 33 U.S. Senate races that are up in this next election, Democrats are defending 23 of those 33, which spreads out the resources. That means, you know, Chuck Schumer and the Democratic uh, Senatorial Committee got 23 races to spend right. money on. Um, Republicans have just 10 that they're defending. Right. Uh, and uh, uh, three of those Dems are sitting in seats that, that Trump won. Right. Um, and, the, and the margins in those seats, uh, Montana is an, a Republican plus 11 seat. Yeah. Ohio's Republican plus six and West Virginia with Joe Manchin, not not every Democrat's favorite Democrat, right. but that's R plus 22. And it sounds like they got the Republican governor, Jim Justice, to run. Um, so, you know, it, this complicates, you know, Democrat situation. So I think having Trump at the top of the ticket, when you look at what happened in 2022, he effectively chose the nominees in all of our battleground states, whether it was Arizona or Georgia or Pennsylvania or New Hampshire. And we got saddled with candidates that weren't up to the task and dealt a little bit too much and crazy. And mm -hmm. he cost Republicans winning the Senate. So, right. um, it, you know, right. it definitely hurts uh, Republicans if he's the nominee. Um, and I don't think, you know, even in a, a conviction is going to be a disqualifier for him. I, I agree. Jay, Jason, let me ask you this. Uh, in 2016, we saw uh, in the primaries, everyone was going after little Marco, lying Ted. They were all going at it. Lindsey Graham was talking about how horrible a human being Trump was. <laughs> and then suddenly they're all like, yeah, we're, we're endorsing Trump. Yeah, uh, Stockholm syndrome is deep with that crowd. Yeah. <laughs> how, how nasty do you see it getting? Or is there is there going to like uh, Ron DeSantis, Chris Christie is, is let it be known. I think he's willing to take on Trump head on. Do you see it's going to is it going to be a nasty fight or, or is there going to be some constraint? knowing that Trump could possibly get the nomination again? Um, no, I, I do think it, it will get nasty, and, and that will start with Trump. Uh, he's already, uh, the super PAC aligned with his campaign, is already spending $1.5 million on ads attacking Ron DeSantis right now. Sure. Um, but going back to 16, and, and you know, for your listeners and viewers, you know, I was Marco Rubio's national media spokesman in 2016 during the campaign, sure. and I would probably do five, interviews a day. And I don't remember a single time ever talking about Marco Rubio. All I talked about was what Donald Trump did, said, or tweeted on any given day. And I would complain to the producers, you know, between breaks, like, can we talk about Marco ever? Or we right. always got to talk about <laughs> Trump. Um, you know, what will be different? You, you won't have, you know, what do we have? 16 uh, candidates at one point. If you remember right. the first debate, they had to do right. it uh, in two different groupings because, right. you know, you can't get 16 people on a stage and have any kind of meaningful conversation. I think having that many people play right into Trump's hands because he always attracts the attention. He sucks up all the oxygen in any room. And so with, you know, 15 other, um, you know, littles in there trying to compete with him, it made it difficult. I don't think you're going to see um, the same kind of field. Uh, one of the, you know, points that, you um, Jeff Rowe, who's running the super PAC for Ron DeSantis, no, no relation, but a, a friend uh, we talked about is this will effectively be a two person race between Trump and DeSantis right. because no one else is going to be able to raise the money to compete with those two guys. Those both of them have the capacity to raise hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, Mike Pence will be lucky to raise 100 million. Nikki Haley will be lucky to raise 50 million. Mike Pompeo will be lucky to raise 50 million. And then Trump gets all this free media on top of right. that, that, you know, you can't even put a dollar figure. And there were some estimates in 2016, he got one billion dollars in free media from the cables and, and, and the print uh, uh, reporters and, and publications. So, um, 
Yeah, I don't. I mean, I think it'll be a narrower field. I also think we have a different record to run against Trump on in 2024 than we did in 2016. He was an unknown. Republican voters had been furious at Republicans in Washington for many years. It wasn't new. And, and seeing the rise of Trump shouldn't have surprised anybody that paid attention to the previous uh, you know, 10 or 15 years in Washington. Um, but now he has a record of losing. I mean, other than winning in 2016, <laughs> he lost the House in 2018. He lost the Senate in 2020. And in 22, the only reason Republicans won the House is because of Ron DeSantis. Now, you, so you may remember, some of your listeners probably had, didn't pay attention, but when the legislature drew new maps for the decennial uh, redistricting, DeSantis didn't like them, drew his own maps, and basically shoved them down their throats against yeah. their will. Yeah. He netted out five seats in the congressional delegation with that map. And yeah. when you look at the narrow margin in the House, without Ron DeSantis's map in his 20-point victory in Florida, there wouldn't be a Republican majority in the House. And I bring this up because if I'm Ron DeSantis, I'm not going to get into an insult slugfest right. with Donald Trump because you're playing in his lane and nobody can beat him at being an idiot. And you look like an idiot if you try. He what about do you, do you see the possibility, the possible scenario where DeSantis gets the nomination and Trump says, screw you, I'm going to run as an independent oh, and sink absolutely. you? Absolutely. I see I, that I all think, day. I do think, you know, there's the potentials of that, but I also think certain states actually have rules, uh, you know, let's call it, you know, sore loser laws, that if you run in the, in the primary and lose, you are not allowed ballot access to run as an independent after the fact. And so he may well do that, but there's going to be a lot of states that aren't going to count his votes. I'm not particularly familiar with all the states and, and, and their rules, but I do want to just finish a point on with Trump today as compared to 2016 and no record, if I'm Ron DeSantis, I'm going to mock him for being a loser and I'm going to diminish him and I'm going to compare it to my record in Florida in which he has legislative accomplishments and political accomplishments. You know, probably the largest margin of the Hispanic vote in Florida history or any state for that matter for a Republican. If you look at his legislative agenda, uh, let's face it, the legislature there are just carrying his water. They ain't got right. any, any strength. Right. And if I, this, I, I got, I got, I got. A, this guy's been losing, losing for our party for how many years? I've been winning. Do you want to win and change the direction of this country, or you want to go down in flames with this loser? I have a quick question for you. We we, we see like Joe Manchin and uh, Kirsten Cinema, who are you know always kind of threatening to leave the party or whatever. Is there really? And 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 this is maybe a, a misconception, but it seems like there's no room in the Republican Party for somebody who would be seen as like, it's like Romney is an outlier. Uh, is there room really for, for people like Joe Manchin? Is, would he be embraced for his being a moderate? It seems hard to be a moderate these days. Uh, would, how, how do you see that? Or would, would Joe Manchin, you know, he threatens to become a Republican. Would they really embrace him? I mean, they'd love his vote. Sure. But, you know, the thing is, um, you know, first of all, Mitch McConnell and Senate Republicans would absolutely embrace him. They're they're not get too caught up in in those things. And you know, listen, he might be vulnerable this time around, but Joe Manchin is an institution in West Virginia. Those people love him. There's a reason he's gotten elected and reelected many times as governor, a U.S. senator in a state that is plus 22 Republicans. So, you know, if he if he were to switch parties, I think he would not even break a sweat. Uh, Arizona is a much different deal. Um, you know, cinema, you know, it's an interesting conversion for her because when she ran for Congress back in, I think, 2012, 2014, she ran as a very progressive anti-war uh, candidate and really had embraced a lot of the, the progressive cultural issues to see her become this kind of McCain light Democrat version is interesting. I don't know that she can survive as an independent. I don't know that Republicans in that state would necessarily embrace her. Uh, Manchin's yeah, actually pretty either. conservative. She is not. Um, it's just like a few fights. But you could see a three-way race in Arizona, right. a Republican, a Democrat, and her as an independent, and that could be a jump ball. Right. You know, you, you real, see, quick, real quickly, yeah. at the, you know, at the time, uh, the Senate race here, we, yeah. Do they have a chance to 
take that seat. Well, as I've mentioned to you before, Adolf, I'm 52 years old. And in those 52 years, there have been 19 Senate terms served in the state of Michigan. And a Republican has served three of those 19. Uh, Robert Griffin in the early late 60s, early 70s uh, for two terms and Spence Abraham uh, for one term from 94 to 2000. As good as Republicans have done in the past in this state, the Senate has always been elusive. Um, you know, I think that Alyssa Slotkin and Chuck Schumer and Debbie Stabenow have done an, a remarkable job of clearing the field for her on the Democratic side. Sure. You know, two not Dems talking right now are not, not a, I think, a terrible threat to, to Slotkin. Uh, right now, none of the Republicans have emerged. I actually think we have a dozen candidates that I think could be good candidates. Right now, the only one that I'm seeing making any kind of moves is Peter Meyer. I think Peter needs probably three qualified conservative primary opponents to get through a primary with his impeachment vote and some of his other votes. Um, and if, you know, if he got unopposed, which I don't think is a likelihood, if, if Peter Meyer was the only credible candidate, you would see some fringe people like Matt DiPerno, who ran for attorney general in 2022, or former Senator Pat Kolbeck, who wouldn't be able to raise any money, but would be able to cause some trouble and maybe thwart his ambitions. I do know uh, um, a very wealthy Michigander from the business side who is, I guess, taking a look at it. A self-funder would be important. You know, we talked about the Dems having 23 seats to defend. What about Canada? seats in the Senate. Each one is one vote. And Michigan might not be the cheapest game in town. There might be other states that are a cheaper uh, campaign than what it might be for Republicans, mm -hmm. given the head start that Slotkin has in her fundraising ability. What about Bessie DeVos or Candace Miller? Are they time? Oh, listen, I, th I think Candace Miller would be an exceptional candidate. She flirted with it early. She pulled back, as she does uh, every two years in some ways right. or another. Um, you know, I, th I listen, I'm a big fan of Betsy DeVos, but she was vilified by Democrats for the last 20 years. And all of a sudden, the DeVos family has become toxic with Republican voters, which is inexplicable to me because they've done more yeah. to help conservatism and the Republican Party in Michigan than any family yeah. ever. And we wouldn't have been red or purple were it not for the DeVosses. But I, I frankly, I think they're they're um, without a home right now in the two yeah. parties. What, what about a yeah. real quick question? Uh, the yeah. VP can yeah. who, who yeah. Would, might Trump pick for VP? Would it be Kerry Lake or who, who do you see? You know, I could see someone like Carrie Lake, um, you know, regardless of what you think of her politics, she's a pretty talented campaigner. She's charismatic. She's great fighting with reporters. So she's I think a loser too. she's a loser, too. Yeah, she, she is among the losers, which is remarkable. If you pay the loser, too. So, Katie yeah, Hobbs ran arguably the worst. Uh, governor's race I've ever seen in the history of America and still won. Yeah. But, you know, so, Trump's not looking for someone that is going to do anything but but be his lick spittle. And right. I think Carrie Lake has qualified herself for that. Right. Yeah. Jason, well, Jason, before you, uh, uh, Adolf is going to wrap it up. I'm going to ask you to do us a favor. Sure. I want to ask that you go on our YouTube page, that you subscribe, like, and hit the notification button. Okay. You got it. All right. Hey, hey, Jason, thanks, thank so you, man. We're going to have thank to have you, you back, man. Anytime, a, Adolf. Anytime. It's getting interesting, I tell you. I let's love grab it. A, let's grab a beer in Corktown next week. Well, let's do that. I'll give All you right. a call. Thank you, right. Jason thanks Rowe, political much. strategist and consultant. I really appreciate you. Listen, he's he he he's been around. It was Rubio's guy, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, he's uh, got a wealth of knowledge. Well, well, uh, final thought. Uh, you well, I, I probably uh, have a, another enemy this week. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah. But uh, everybody have a wonderful upcoming week. Um, I do want to share something that's interesting. I heard today that there are more children being admitted to the hospital for COVID than Re adults. Recently. Recently? Very yes, very recently. I, I heard this from a medical it. medical profession. So listen, be safe out there. Uh, COVID is still alive. Um, be safe. Have a wonderful, productive week, and see you guys next week. I, I I mean, there are you know every week they show like fifty five hundred confirmed cases. There's got to there's really got to be twenty thousand each week because everyone's home testing those. 
who are getting confirmed are probably people who have gone to the doctor because they're feeling so sick. The majority of people are staying home and getting their home testing, which you can get free. Your insurance will cover up to eight. You can go to any drugstore, get eight free tests, uh, put it on your, they put it on your insurance or whatever. But my, my, my final words are, you know, when Eric Brown and, and you guys talked about the, the reading in the school district, it's, it's not only criminal, but it's like I, I blame part of the media, but the media doesn't have the resources used to have two education reporters at, you know, now there's probably no dedicated reporters covering exclusively education, as far as I know, like at the news of the free press and certainly not at the TV stations. And so what's happening is this is flying under the radar. We've got a school system that's, that's broke. That's broke. You have when you have high dropout rates, when you have re- really high dropout rates, no drop in rates. Okay, and, and, and you have <laughs> they're not even dropping in who are not reading. You know when they, they say only five percent before COVID. Yeah. Now they really behind. But it's, you know, but but you know what? That's something we're gonna have to talk, talk about, about next week. Yeah, we will. And 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 I want to say my final thought: Fuck you, Charlie LaDuff. <laughs> 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 all right. Back well, next week. All right. Detroit back next week. Detroit in black and whites. <laughs>